The Nine Eyes of Lucin gives us a glimpse into the history of a mysterious figure. And here's what I thought of it after reading it with mine eyes. Eh? <laughs> this video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first half of this video will be spoiler free for the book that is. It's kind of hard to talk about the book without talking about campaign two spoilers. Um, but yes, yeah, so for those who want to read it after watching, it's the second half when I will get into some of the more spoilery aspects of the book, talking about the things that I didn't like and the things that I did like. I'm your god. Long may I reign. Eat of my fruits. The book is written by Madeline Rue, a New York Times bestselling author who's written for a number of intellectual properties such as Star Wars, World of Warcraft, and Dungeons and Dragons, as well as her own original series Asylum and House of Furies. When writing Nine Eyes of Lucian, she worked closely with both Matthew Mercer and Talos and Jaffe, and she was encouraged by them to take some risks with the character. Uh, I've worked with quite a few IPs now, like this is not my first radio, right. and I think they hit the perfect balance of here are the rules and here are the things we need you to do and here are the limitations mm -hmm. but we really want you to go like we want you we want your voice we want your perspective and we want creativity so you know we'd rather you take big swings and then we like pull you back than sort of like hedge and be really careful which is how they usually are right, right, right. this book which follows the life of lucin the villain from campaign two of critical role is absolutely written for critters and not just written for critters but critters who specifically have watched campaign two i honestly don't see any way that you could read this book without having seen the campaign it just wouldn't make any sense. Unlike the first book which Critical Role released, uh, Kith and Kin, you could read that and understand it even if you hadn't seen Campaign 1 because it's a standalone story. I'm actually really curious if any of you out there have read this without watching Campaign 2 and if so, what you thought. The first part, or probably closer to two thirds, focuses on the early years of Lucian's life. I feel like I trip over that name all the time, Lucian. Yes, it focuses on the early years of Lucian's life, living in Shady Creek Run as a 12 year old with an also 12 year old Cree, and then right up to the moment we meet him in the campaign. It spans about 10 years, that first section, and shows us glimpses of Lucian's training as a blood hunter and the establishment of the Tomb Takers. I think this portion of the book could be enjoyed by any Critical Role fan, and I also think it would probably read well for someone without much knowledge of Critical Role, you know, if you were happy to be in the dark about some aspects of the story and the world building. The second part of the book picks up where we meet Lucian in the campaign, as the Mighty Nine and the Tomb Takers travel to Aeor and then through the city of Cognosa. This part definitely requires knowledge of the latter part of the campaign. In fact, even though I've watched it, it was just so long ago that I really struggled with some sections of the book because they do rely on your campaign two knowledge quite heavily. In general, I thought this book was a really fun read with some cool characters and some really cool moments. There's this scene in Lucian's childhood that might actually give me nightmares. I thought it was really cool and dark and twisted. And it was really interesting spending some more time with the Tomb Takers and seeing how they perceived the Mighty Nine. I also love that the book stars a ton of queer characters. And while I do wish they had been a little more overt about it in some instances, since it sort of took me a little while to pick up on some of those uh, relationships and dynamics, it's also really refreshing to have their gender and sexuality not be the sole defining feature of these characters, which, you know, can sometimes happen. One character, Otis, uses she, her, he, him, and they them pronouns and I thought the author did such a fantastic job in using all of those pronouns but still making it clear that it was Otis speaking. The thing that I struggled with the most though with this book was the pacing. The first parts of the book do time skip quite a bit which I enjoyed because we saw these sort of glimpses of Lucian as he's growing up and what kind of a person he's shaping into. However there were some scenes that were skipped over quite quickly that I felt like maybe had been edited down for length or just not fully fleshed out and that left me sort of feeling a bit all over the place place as we jump from scene to scene and I felt this much more so in the Aeor sections of the book where everything feels alternatively quite rushed but also very slow in some places. I gotta say and maybe this is a hot take but I wish that the book had ended with Lucian's first death. I think it would have been so dramatic to end with that death knowing what ends up happening to him. Once we hit the events of Aeor a lot of the tension was gone for me because we already know what happens and whilst we do see the events from a different perspective to the way it played out in the campaign I felt like these different perspectives didn't add a lot of new information except for one major plot point which we'll get to 
do in the spoilery section. I would have rather the book focused solely on Lucian's early life because that is all new storylines and, you know, I felt like there was a lot of untapped potential, especially with some of Lucian's family connections. Personally, I really want to see new storylines in these supplementary releases, new stories, new locations, new characters. I totally understand that they do need some kind of tie-in into their main media in order to sell to fans, but I think you can do that without recapping the events of a campaign. You know, imagine a pirate adventure with Kingsley, or the romance story of the Ruby of the Sea and the Gentleman, or the adventures of Kiri, or a story about Essek growing up in the Kryn dynasty. Super quick additional to this, Critical Role just submitted a trademark for the name Essek Thalys, which gives me a lot of hope that we're maybe going to see an Essek book in the future. It could be for a comic book, but I don't know, it would be super exciting to have a whole book about Essek. There are so many wonderful characters and stories that could be explored in Exandria that are not as connected to the main campaigns. Of course, this is just my opinion. Your mileage may vary. Overall, from what I could gather online, it does seem like the book was very well received, so maybe I'm the only one who wants like a true standalone story. Storytelling and shaping a narrative is a skill that I am very invested in developing as a creator, so I have been taking some classes from today's sponsor, Skillshare. I'm working really hard to make content creation my full-time job and expanding my skills has been a really important part of that process. You know, I think a lot of us nowadays are trying to find work that fulfills us creatively and Skillshare has hundreds of career-focused classes that can help you kickstart your goals, whether that's attracting the right clients for your current job or launching your own small business, building your portfolio, or better managing your time to allow for greater productivity. No goal is too small and you can reach them using Skillshare's step-by-step -step classes. Right now, I am taking a productivity and time management class with Kate Ahrens, which has really helped me narrow down the million of ideas I have for content creation and focus my time effectively. The new year really is the perfect time to reinvent your goals and yourself. So the first 1,000 people who join using the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Now back to the video. Okay, let's jump into some more spoilery aspects of the book. So if this is where you leave us. To Alpha and Alpha, we trek till homeward bound we be. <laughs> Maybe we'll see you there. Lucian's backstory truly is the stuff of nightmares and one of my favorite plot lines in this book. A witch turns his dead brother into a walking corpse and his parents just carry on like everything is normal and then Lucian burns down his house with his parents and his sock brother in it. Blech. And not only that, but Lucian lures people to the witch's cottage so that she can turn them into sock puppets. Like... Ugh. There's a really interesting parallel there between Lucian and Caleb, who was puppeted to burn down his own family home. The witch character, Azrahari, I think I'm saying that correctly, was one of my favourite characters in this book, and I'm honestly a little sad we didn't get to see more of her. She had a pretty lacklustre death, and I think that was to show how far Lucian has come since his days as a scared child. But I also felt like this was a really clever nod to how swingy D&D combat can be sometimes, you know, if you're lucky enough to get like a critical hit and just destroy the scary monster that your dungeon has spent all of this time setting up. This whole plot line really sets up how deeply messed up Lucian is by his past and his trauma, and this through line of sock puppets is sort of apparent throughout the book as we get to Aeor and at the end when Lucian is literally puppeting the Tomb Takers. As young kids, Cree and Lucian are basically best friends, with Cree following Lucian because he has the glint, and I was taught that if you stumble upon a fellow with the glint, you follow and follow close. Wherever they go, fate comes fast on their heels. This reason for Cree kind of following Lucian around did somewhat bother me because Lucian is a total asshole, and I didn't feel like it was a good enough reason for her to stick around, especially in some of the earlier parts of sort of the Aeor plot and Azra sort of untangling all of the Somnova and stuff. Like he really was truly acting like an asshole. Although having said that, I think everybody at one point in their life has people that they know who stay in relationships with assholes and from the outside, we can't see why. We're just like, why are you staying with this person? I just want to add that I'm specifically talking about before he gets the powers from the Somnovan that lets him influence people. Of course, once he gets those powers, we do see Kree kind of pushing back a little bit on some of his decisions and him manipulating her with those powers. So of course she stays in those instances because she doesn't have any choice. Overall, I really liked reading about them together and it was really heartbreaking when Lucian sacrifices her in the end. This sacrifice was foreshadowed quite well, I think, by the Mage's journal as we see him sort of 
turning on his colleagues and viewing them more as tools and then ultimately obstacles to his like ascension. Cree always seemed like an even more mysterious figure than Lucian to me in the campaign, so I really enjoyed seeing more of her here and kind of getting a, maybe a bit more of an insight into what was going through her mind in all of those scenes. Cree and Lucian and Brevin, a half Goliath, end up training with the Claret Order to become blood hunters. I would have loved to have seen more of this portion of the book, however narratively I think it works that we don't linger here for too long since Lucian felt pretty lackluster about the orders and he sort of clashed with the authority figures there. It didn't really fulfill his ideal of being someone, you know, like being a figurehead, being a leader, making changes in the world. And because he wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, it makes sense that we are sort of brought out of that part of the book really quickly as well. After ditching the orders, they end up in Rexentron where we meet Vesta Rogner. I quite enjoyed her characterization and I did find it to be true to what we saw in the campaign, or at least my recollection of it. It's been a while since I've watched Campaign 2. In Rexentrum, Lucian meets up with his long-lost sister Aldreda, who he has lost contact with, he hasn't seen her for many, many years. This scene probably bothered me the most in the book. It felt like we had been building to this moment for quite a while, Lucian had been looking for her for so long, and I ended up kind of finding it a little stilted, or maybe I just felt like we didn't have any time to sit in it, so he sort of goes there for a few minutes and then ends up leaving and that's sort of the last we hear of it and while I completely think it makes sense that Eldreda would be angry and upset at him I don't know I think I was just expecting more from that scene and it felt more like a footnote to the rest of Lucian's story. So eventually we end up on that initial journey to Aeor with Vesta Rogna. This is a journey that we had only heard about in campaign two because it happened off screen. It's a vague reference to a tomb takers or a tomb uh, a, a group that has a title similar to that um, out of Shady Creek Run. I really enjoyed this section of the book because I was just so happy to see more of Aeor. You know, since the Mighty Nine raced through it so quickly in Campaign 2, I just felt like there was so many cool things in Aeor to discover. And while we didn't get to see, you know, a huge amount of them here because they sort of have to keep the plot line moving, it was just great to get even more glimpses. I think, honestly, we could see a whole book set in Aeor and just exploring all of the ruins there. All right, so while in Aeor, they retrieve an artifact from a stasis bubble for Vess, and this is when Lucian finds a hidden door containing the journal and the skeleton of the long-dead mage. The ruins begin to crash around them, you know, classic way of getting people out of the, <laughs> of the space that they're in, and they race to the surface with Lucian dropping the journal and Brevin going to retrieve it for him, which ultimately results in her death. I was kind of taken aback to realize after her death that she and Lucian had been in an intimate relationship. I think it probably is alluded to earlier in the book, but I just didn't pick it up or I just didn't realize how close their relationship was. So it sort of caught me by surprise just how bereft Lucian was. Because he is kind of an asshole, we don't really always see his actual feelings towards his fellow Tomb Takers. After this experience, the Tomb Takers betray Vess and refuse to escort her back, instead striking out on their own and ending up back in the Savile Wood in Yardil. Lucian has been reading the journal this whole time and discovering the red eyes upon his body and sort of coming into his powers from the Somnovum, like being able to read people's minds and influence people, make friends. I really enjoyed the journal portions of the book and this mirroring of the mage's journey to Lucian's. He also begins to hear the members of the Somnovum in his mind and the book demonstrates this with different fonts. So like, oh, I don't know how well that's going to show up on camera, but there are sort of different fonts in the book for when different members of the Somnovum talking. Lucian comes up with a plan to ask Vess to perform a magic spell that he finds in the book, which he believes will allow him to speak with the city directly. In exchange, he offers Vess the book and she agrees, meeting the tomb takers at the Savalier Wood. However, surprising <laughs> no one but Lucian, she betrays him and she uses this as an opportunity to kill him. The spell she cast on him splintered his soul, leaving one portion inside his body which would eventually wake up to become Molly. So it's kind of great that we get a little bit of an explanation as to how that actually happened. There is a great line here referencing Molly when as Lucian is dying he says, No, he cried. I won't be made hollow. I won't be empty. When Molly first awoke, the word he repeated over and over was empty, which led them to call him M.T., and then he chose the name Molly Mork Tealeaf. The book then time skips to after Molly's life when Lucian is revived by Cree and the Somnovum. And this is when we mostly get a recap of the events of Campaign 2 from Lucian's perspective. While there were some good moments in there, I kind of felt like this whole section was a bit rushed and we didn't see too much new stuff that we didn't already know. The one thing that is a pleasant surprise is the fact that Molly's soul was still present in Lucian and speaking to him. I got especially emotional in the final fight when Molly 
is sort of accepting his own self-annihilation as a way of ending Lucian at the same time. And we have that moment that we saw in the campaign where Lucian sort of ripped himself apart. And in the book, it's sort of described as them mutually ripping their souls apart, leaving space for something or someone new. Your eyes open for the first time. (laughs) (laughs) Bolts up and runs. I race after. <laughs> Stops. <laughs> 100 episodes or so later. Overall, I really enjoyed the book, and while there are some aspects of it that I didn't love, it was a fun read, and I think the author did a great job of managing all the different voices and perspectives living inside this one body. Plus there are so many great Easter eggs in there for critters, like there's this one. The bearded mercenary snorted. You can certainly try. Oh, and this one, this one is the best one. This one literally made me gasp when I read it. Glory to Gorus and Vitalio Maximus. Wealth and long life to their offspring, Morbo, Cilio, and Bolo. Nice to meet you, (laughs) Ambola. <laughs> and a lot of the dialogue between the Tomb Takers and the Mighty Nine is word for word as it appeared in the campaign. I also saw so many great reviews for the audiobook, and while I haven't listened to all of it, I was really curious how they handled the latter half, so I did listen to that, and it's really neat hearing the conversations between Lucian and Molly, performed by Matt and Talazin, and the other cast members, you know, reprising their characters. Robbie did such an excellent job with the narration. I mean, it's no surprise really that the show with the nerdy ass voice actors can make an excellent audiobook. I would love to know what you think about this book and whether you read the physical book or you listened to the audiobook and what your favorite part was. And if you need some more Mighty Nine content in your life, you can check out my Mighty Nine reunion special breakdowns here. Once again, thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and thank you so much to my patrons and YouTube members. Bye!